move into some topics then. Okay, so today's lecture, as I mentioned, um, is a uh, a more conceptual one. Um, we will be seeing some hands-on models. And if things go according to plan, we'll actually see another tool. I'll use our studio to, to present a bit of analysis of data. Um, but uh, I'm going to be addressing a topic that is very little discussed within the agent-based framework, but has actually enormous practical implications. It bears thinking um, as a sort of reflection on, on modeling and, and what we're doing with modeling. But where I think it's most important is in thinking about the interface between empirical data and what empirical data is telling us um, about the structure of the processes driving phenomena in the world. So you could think of this lecture, just like the lecture on calibration, as, as dealing with this interface between what's going on out there in the world and, and the evidence that comes from the world, the, the empirical observations, and, and when that encounters our models. Because evidence for the world, as we saw with calibration, can ground our models. It can challenge our models. It can help falsify our models. And it can help improve our models. And when we calibrate them successfully, calibrate parameters to it. Build confidence in our models. But it turns out data from the world has more information than that. Calibration, in calibration, we sought to take advantage of many types of data from the world. Um, in the sphere of infectious disease modeling, which many of you are interested, this might include, for example, you know, classic health system data, cases, tests conducted, hospital admissions, you know, hospital discharges, census, deaths, those sort of things. But it might also include other factors. For example, it might include number of posts of possibly symptomatic individuals on social media. It might include factors from smartphone mobility data. It might include data from wastewater. And, and you know, in, in calibration, we're trying to get a model to align with all of those. So we'll have data from the world and we'll have something in the model that kind of corresponds to that data, we expect to match that data and we'll, we'll try to align them. And often we discover we can't well, and it tells us something about our model. As we'll see though today, when we're dealing with these complex coupled nonlinear systems in the world, even one sort of data can often clue us in to key features of the external world. Just one sort of data hints to us, whispers to us about the rest of what's going on in the world in sort of a holographic way. If we know about one source of data, it tells us about the system that's driving it, which is also involved in other sorts of data. Now that may sound strange and, and even implausible, but um, it's a mathematical fact. And it was proven in the 1980s by mathematician Floris Takens and its famous Takens embedding theorem. And it holds for a wide variety of systems. And the topic that we're gonna be talking about today directly relates to this. So it, it's, it's the topic of state space. State space, techniques or a set of techniques that are, are uh, provide important lenses in dynamical systems area. And you will find in the modern canon of data analysis, 
examples of these popping up that we'll be seeing. And they're important because they're model free techniques in many cases. They don't assume a particular model structure, but they hint to us what model structures might need to be. And I wanna talk about agent-based models because it's easy to think, it's easy to fall into the pattern um, of thinking that agent-based models must occupy and circulate in a massively large state space. And to a degree that's true, nominally that's true. But in fact, the actual exercise portion of that space space is very thin. It's very, it's very flat, so to speak. So it's much lower dimensionality. So anyway, that was a, a bit of a preface. So I, I wanna talk about this. And I wanna talk about this interface between data and models in a new way. I'm going to go switch here to, to our subject of today. So I'll be talking about state space, which is often termed phase space, um, partly for historic reasons. We're going to be talking about nominal and intrinsic dimensionality, the, the sort of theoretical number of degrees of freedom of a system versus how much it actually occupies, the, the amount that's actually occupied by it or exercised by it. Well, well as time allows, we'll talk about state-space reconstruction. So as I mentioned, this is about this interface between what's going on in the world and what's going on in the model. And it's about how data from the world emer emerging from a from a complex environment out there in the world with lots of moving parts, lots of features, lots of coupling, lots of messiness, lots of entangling, lots of nonlinearity. It turns out that that gives rise to its signatures, to its fingerprints, which show up in data. So we take data from these systems Measurements that may be incomplete, they may be noisy, non-continuous, uh, you know, messy. And yet we could use this data to, to inquire about this system out there in the world in important ways. And, and often what we see within this data is a reflection of the underlying structure of this system that gave rise to it, this data generating process. Good statisticians are often keenly aware the data doesn't come from heaven. Data isn't handed to us, you know, um, springing full born like Apollo from Zeus's head, you know, just, just appearing out of nowhere. It comes from processes that generate it. And it has the fingerprints of, and it whispers about the structure of those processes. And our models are about those processes. And we expect an alignment and we expect some sort of consistency between them. So we're gonna be talking here about state space. Um, and I want to introduce this notion of state space. Um, I'm going to be introducing this notion of state space. We're talking about the state space of a model. But be aware that systems out there in the world have a state space as well. The systems out there in the world have a certain situation that obtains at any one point, And that situation is evolving over time. And that can be that is associated with some sort of configuration space or state space. There's some situation that is in a set of possibilities and those collectively define the state space. So when we're dealing with a model, you know, we're, we're used to dealing with, with behavior over time. And if I had had my, my, uh, presence of mind, I would have 
shown a, a graph earlier, a fever over time, but it might look like something like this. So we have prey, perhaps uh, here oscillating, we have predators oscillating here over time. And that's just what we're used to dealing with also with models, right? So let, let's call up one of those models and we'll, we'll see one of those graphs. I didn't have the presence of mind to, 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 to anticipate it, but we're not passive quantities. We can go go get it. So so let's go go get that now. And um, I will just uh, switch over to the uh, course site, and I'd invite you to download a um, a model here, which is called Predator. Excuse me. Let's let's first get this SIRS crowding disparities version 14 with stratified projected state space. That sounds like it might involve state space, eh? Okay, so let's let's go get that one. And while you're at it, why don't you get this one too? Predator prey agent based modif agent based modified for state space two. I think that's actually a more recent version of that. In fact I'm Sure, there, sure there is. Um, so let's just get the the first of these right now, okay? Um, and I'm I'll I'll make sure the other yes, there's a version six of it. So I I will post the other one right now. I will post it post haste. Uh, so if you give me a moment, I'll get the the right one up there. So here we go. Create. And uh, there we go, version six. And there we go, and add item. Okay, great. So you can get the last two of them. SARS crowding disparities version 14. You may think you've seen this before, but you've only seen 13. So this is 14. You only saw the witches dozen version, but this is the 14 on and and then there's predator prey agent based modified for state space <clears throat> version six. Okay. So go get those down and go load them up into any logic. Okay. So uh, buh, 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 um, we will get them up here as well. Okay. So, so here is. the SIRS crowding disparities, and you've seen this before. You may be comparatively sick of it. I'm gonna run the regular simulation, which should really be called baseline, my bad. Um, I'm gonna run that and we will see lots of this time behavior that we're very used to. Um, uh, this is a bit of a small model. It's not as interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll, ma I'll make it, um, uh, large population here, large population. I'll, I'll do that, okay? Let, let's go see how, just how large it is to make sure it's not, not gonna break the bank, so to speak. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's about what I want. That's about what I want. Okay, good. So we're gonna, I'm gonna run this. Okay, um, and you'll notice it, it looks like it died out that time by chance. Um, so it, nothing, nothing too interesting happened. I'll run it again. Let's see if we can get it to, to sort of spread, um, more persistently. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so we're seeing some dynamics etched out of the fractional prevalence and the incident case count here. And there's there's some other dynamics uh, up here involving connection counts, or it's it's not dynamics, but connection counts for people, and the number of infection counts people to which people are subject. Low income versus high income. You see, the high income is a troublingly large disparity from the low income. Low income is shifted to the right, for example. And if you look at income versus personal infection count, you'll find that for higher incomes, 
people have fewer infections. This is real disparities of health, real health fact, inequities here coming about in large part because of this concentration of people of lower income, people in crowded conditions. Okay, but what I want to draw your attention to here is, is the main lens we've been using, which is a lens of behavior over time. These are dynamic models, so it's natural. We're talking about behavior over time, dynamic model, right? Um, and that's a very useful lens. We can plot out different aspects of behavior over time. But what we're seeing on the right here is a different sort of lens. So what's called a, a state space, or technically here, it's a projected state space. And what we see here is that neither axis is time. No, no, no. The x-axis is susceptible. The y-axis is effective. So we see the model starting way down here with lots of susceptibles and few infections. Remember, x axis is susceptible. So we have a thousand or so susceptibles and almost you know, close to zero infections. Obviously, there was one, uh, at least one. And then what we see in these dots are for successive reporting time points which I would surmise are either daily or, or weekly. Um, let's, let's go see, for those for last night, this should be old hat up. There's a daily reporting event. It goes off every day, recurrence time one day. Okay, so these must be successive days here. What's going on? Can anyone give a, give sort of a, a pithy statement? What's if if you had to summarize what's going on for this bunch of days, how would you how would you summarize it? What's happening? There are more what and fewer what. Yeah, few, more infectious over time. That's why it's going up along this axis, right along the y-axis, and fewer susceptibles. That's why it's going to the left along here, right? So going from this one to this one, we've had an increase in infectives, that's this axis, and a decrease in susceptibles, right? So these are successive time points. And you'll notice it continues on that trend almost linearly for a while, right? Um, that should give you pause, because I mean, that sort of linear trade-off isn't obvious when you look over here that, you know, susceptibles are going down at roughly the same rate, infectives are going up, but it's really clear on a state space plot. You can see at once, boom, the relationship between them. And what those, what that's suggesting is that they, roughly speaking, they total up to the same thing. You know, you go up by 10 infectives and you go down by 10 susceptibles, for example. Um, and, uh, and that goes on for a number of days, but then you start to see something different at the top. Um, where is the number of infectives the maximum here? At what point is it the maximum? Can anyone say? More, yeah, more than 550. It's right here is the peak. And then it starts to decline, right? And here, susceptibles are still going down. But so are infectives, right? Or having infectives go down, that's downwards along here, that it's going down. So it's coming down here and it's going down in, in susceptibles, right? And then, but it's not, yeah, it's not a linear trade off between them. And then you start to see here, it, you know, the number of infectives is dropping, number of susceptibles isn't changing much. And then the number of susceptibles starts to, what's going on here? It's starting to rise again, right? Because it's bending this way. And then you see it go down here to some sort of tangle, which is actually a sort of vortex. It's sort of going around and in, in, in a bit of a cycle, a bit of a cycle here, right? 
sort of repeating a certain cyclic pattern, trading off susceptibles and effective. So it's not a perfect circle, but it's sort of trading them off, trading them off, which if you look at it and squint your eyes, starts to look a little bit like what's going on here. It's going in cycles. Of course, we're not plotting here susceptibles. We could, right? Um, but the point is the state space plots are a different view, right? They're, they're a different way of understanding the situation. And, and actually, they're a, a really useful way of understanding the situation. Um, okay, where, where, am I, where are my slides here? Um, okay, um, so uh, the state space plots provide this, this way of sort of parsing, parsing out the, the current situation. And basically each element of model state in a traditional model is captured by an axis. Now we only had two, right? We had susceptible and infected. We didn't have exposed and we didn't have recovered, but there's more than that. I mean, we're dealing with an ancient base model and you know, uh, there's something else that's not captured. We'll come back to that point, but the idea is the state space plot should have an axis for each dimension of model state. So if you have, you know, kind of susceptible, kind of infective, kind of, of recovered, um, those should be different axes. And a given run of the model, a given trajectory, a given sort of um, outcome of the model over time or output of the model is illustrated with a trajectory, right? This is what I'm calling a trajectory here. It's sort of some curve through this space, right? Yeah. Um, it, it kind of starts at some particular point. That's the initial state here, right? And it flows forward. You can think of it as like a, a marble starting at this point and kind of rolling along here. And the direction at which time is progressing isn't obvious here, but um, uh, I'll tell you that this was the starting point. So this is the initial state of the model. This is the initial condition. And time rolls on, the marble rolls on, and it's rolling down towards a state of what is often dynamic or static equilibrium, either an ongoing sort of cycle or a state of balance commonly. Um, so, here, time is implicit. Like we have no axis of time, right? I mean, each of these things is associated with a different point in time, but it's just sort of a waypoint along these. Some of them, you notice, are closer space, like this. These two here. Um, well, some are further apart, like these, and and it's a reflection of its velocity, right? The marble's going really quick here. So if you if you capture it one second and the next second, it's really moved a lot here. It was going quite slow. So if you capture it one second and the next, it wasn't going that that quickly, right? Um, uh, and for a nonlinear model, this behavior can actually differ quite a lot across different areas of state space. Now, these sorts of methods have most commonly been pursued for models that are that are aggregate in character. Um, and I show an example model here with susceptibles, infectives, and temporarily immune folks. You can call this and could be forgiven for calling an SIRS model. So this model will hopefully, although this course focuses on age-based modeling, um, this the structure of this model hopefully will at least have some sense of familiarity. We have a count of susceptible, the count of infections, and a count of temporarily immune folks. Again, this is not an agent-based model. There's a stock and flow, model, right? Um, compartmental system dynamics, you can use different cognate terms for it. But this model has a, a set of states. What are the states of this model? What are the what are the states of this model? If, if we had to sort of run this model and then we want to stop it, save away the information 
about its current situation and you know shut down our computer and come back and restart it, what three pieces of information would we need to save away? Can anyone tell me? Susceptible, infective, and uh, temporarily immune, right? Okay, kind of weird names there. Okay, that's right. So there's really three pieces of information that we might want to save away, right? And that would totally specify the state because, and maybe some of you won't be familiar with it, but within a model like this, the rates of change of each of these stocks, the values of these flows are totally determined by the current state and constant. And if you want to think of this as a set of ordinary differential equations, what it's saying is, you know, if you know the value of the flow, if you know the value of the states, the state variables, the compartments, you can use any term for it. You can figure out what the derivatives are for them, right? And and with the derivatives, you can figure out what they evolve to in the next little bit of time, and you can do it again, and so on. So the three pieces of information here that are part of state are susceptible, infected, and temporarily immune. Now, there's a nuance here that I'm not getting to, but I'm going to get to in just a moment. So this is a model. It's a very simple model. It's a compartmental model where of a sort where these sorts of methods have been very widely applied. And we could plot out its state space, right? Here, we might plot it in three dimensions, right? Susceptible in one, this is a state space, right? Or equally, you can say it's a phase space. So we have susceptible in one dimension, infective on another, and, and this temporarily immune on the, the third. That's one for each of these, right? That, that's what I said here, right? Um, each independent, each element of model state that's susceptible, infective, temporarily immune, it's associated with an axis, right? These are these three axes. And a given run of the model is the trajectory. It starts at the initial state of the model, which in this case has almost everyone susceptible. That's a choice. S is around a thousand. There's almost no infectives, and there's there's no one yet temporarily bound. And then what starts to happen is what's that? Decrease. Decrease susceptible. It's kind of hard to see because it's in three dimensions here, but you can exercise your imagination. You know, uh, susceptibles decrease and infectives increase. It's kind of going into the board here. Um, well, okay, sorry, sorry. It's going like, uh, yeah, it's going, it's got to go this way with infectives and it's got to come this way with, with susceptibles. And, um, and then, you know, the number of uh, recovered people are going up, temporarily recovered. But then it starts to loop around, right? Because people, amongst other things, are going to start getting susceptible again. So it's going to loop and start increasing susceptible while, while still uh, building the number of temporarily immune people, et cetera. And it's going to go to, uh, to, uh, to a, a, a vortex of sort. It's going to go to this limit called the limit cycle. Or, or it's actually it's not a limit cycle. It's, a, it's an attractor. It's going to go to this a tractor with eigenvalues which are mad or which are complex for those who care and have negative real components. Um, but it circles in on this equilibrium where it's going to be in balance. And at this point, the inflows of all these stocks will equal the outflows, and each of these stocks will have a derivative of zero at the equilibrium. That's why it's in balance. Inflow equals outflow, and There'll be a fixed number of susceptibles, effectives, and temporarily moon at this point, and it will be a balance. Okay, that's the idea. That's an endemic equilibrium, right? It's the bug is staying around, right? Okay. Um, but if we take a look at this closely from the right angle, you're going to see something that some of you might have picked up on already. It might be sticking in your craw. You look at it from the right angle, it's totally flat. And what that's telling us is that, well, if we 
increase the number of susceptibles, for example, there's some we could figure out. Basically, we could figure out from only two of these, these third. If, if you tell me any two, I can figure out the third one. The, the, a combination of two totally defines this plane. A plane is, is defined by, by just two pieces of information, not, not three. Um, and this is an indication, in fact, that, well, if we look at this, it may appear for all intents and purposes to be three-dimensional. I mean, you, you count up the number of state variables or compartments or stocks or whatever you want to call them, and you have two. In fact, it's, oh, sorry, you have three. In fact, it's two-dimensional. Can anyone give an explanation for, why do I say that, in fact, earlier I said three pieces of information on what you need to specify the system and that's true at a certain level, but you actually don't need three. You need just two. Why is that? What other, if you know one constant value, what what constant value would I know that would mean from just two pieces, two of these values, I could figure out the third? The total population. Because I know at any one time, they have to total up to the pop, total population, right? Total population is a constant. and there's a conservation of people, right? If people, the number in temporarily moon is just the total population minus S minus I. We have no births and deaths. It's a closed population. So S plus I plus the total population plus the temporary immune equals some constant. And what that means is S plus I can be given you know, given those, you could figure out ti, or given i and ti, you could figure out s or whatever. So you really only need two. You know the total population. You know the constant, right? Um, or equally much so, if you know the fractions, you could figure out. You know the, the fraction of, for two of them. You could figure out the fraction for the other. And that's what the state space is telling us. But what I'm saying is that. If you were to have a system like this and see data like this, and, and in fact, you do see data like this, I'll show you in a minute, this sort of system, and you see a phenomenon like this where it's flat, it's telling you something about the structure of the system that essentially, you know, there's, there's a conservation property going on. That, oh. Um, uh oh. Can you? Uh, sorry. It, 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 it gave up an indication of. Can you guys hear me okay? Can anyone indicate if you can hear me? Barely. Barely? Uh, it's, it, it's okay now. I said, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying is the structure of this system, in fact, the system, the state of it can be specified in two numbers, but I'm saying the data produced by a system like this can tell you this as well. This is a fact that with two numbers and the total population you can, which is just a constant, it's not an aspect of state, we can figure out the third. So this actually has just, a two-dimensional state space. There are only two degrees of freedom. The third one is totally given from those two. That's also indicated in the data put out by this system. The, the state space occupied by the system in practice, you might think it's three-dimensional, but the structure of that, that area of it that's occupied, that manifold, is is actually a lower dimensional manifold it's it actually looks like a lower dimensional surface in this case it's like a plane it's kind of like this this sack for my headphones it's in 3d space right but if i look at it it really 
is essentially a 2D object. It's just embedded in 3D space. There's this broader space around it that's 3D. And maybe it's curved a bit or something like that, but essentially it is locally 2D. And there's fancy words for this in differential geometry. It's homeomorphic to a lower dimensional Euclidean space. But this is a two-dimensional object. It's a two-dimensional manifold in 3D space. It's, it's a kind of subspace that is locally just like a 2D space. And I'm saying the data from the world is like this too. It will whisper to us about the structure of the system. Now, we can contrast this to a 3D and Nona had the right point. And I apologize to the for you know the brutal, the poor aesthetics of this, but we have a system where we have people coming in and people leaving due to mortality. For example, it's an open system. We might need three state variables to specify this because there's no constant population. You know, uh, we could we could have we have three degrees of freedom. We get, we have number of susceptibles, infectives, and recover. We can't for many two of them specify what the third is based on some total population or anything like that. We really need all three to specify how it will evolve. Now, you folks may think that this is sounding all airy fairy, but in fact, <clears throat> data from the world are very useful when looked at through this lens. And the details of these lenses differ a bit, but they all have this flavor of, you know, you 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 don't look at something over time. I mean, obviously that's useful as well, but in this lens, you look, the axes are not time. The axes are different variables, you know, at the same point in time. So in this case, like the daily reported cases, and daily reported deaths, for example. These are two axes, right? Um, and here we can plot out the evolution of a system. This is an empirical system. This is, I grabbed it from Twitter. Um, Marco Piani, who does uh, a lot of analyses. This is from UK data. This is uh, July 16th, 2021, a, a good day. Um, uh, and this, uh, this, for example, illustrates a, a cycle that the system went in, you know, over time where initially we were having, and I believe these, these earlier ones uh, are, the, are the lighter ones, the lighter ones are earlier in time. So cases went up first and only deaths went up later, and there's kind of this retrograde motion here, but cases went up more without deaths going up too much, and the deaths rose. And then cases started to go down even as deaths rose, partly reflecting the fact that people spend weeks in the ICU before dying often and so on. And then cases are in retreat, and then eventually deaths start to go down. And these are data from, from actual systems. This is another data from a hospitalization, you know, daily admission versus beds full in, in England. And you see, once again, the cycle. Now, these cycles are very emblematic of what we see in, in our models. I mean, these cycles, right? There we go. Um, and, and you see them in data over time with sort of rises and falls in this, right? These cycles up and down and so on, um, involving multiple types of data. And we see them in this empirical data uh, in these state space plots. You could look at it with other types of illustrations as well. And this is data, um, I think, which I added for some synthetic noise to, uh, for here in Canada, looking at during the pandemic successive waves, you can kind of see uh, the first wave here, um, uh, second wave, and this is actually, this data 
it's a little bit different because here I'm actually not plotting, you know, cases versus deaths versus hospital beds falling. I'm actually plotting cases now, cases say a day ago, cases two days ago, or cases now a week ago, two weeks ago. And it turns out that, that the information from that is going to be very, very similar to what you'll get if I looked at cases, deaths, and a hospital bed, because the two are so coupled that looking at one is like looking at the other. And we're we're going to come back to that point as time allows. Okay. So I had mentioned that equilibria are found in state space that can go to a state of where it's kind of imbalanced or near balance, where inflows are equal to outflows. If we're thinking about it for a from a an aggregate perspective. And um and often, you know, it will cycle around it in what's called a limit cycle, or it will be a sink where it will flow into it and often cycle as it's flowing into it in kind of a vortex. Um, and uh, it turns out that, that this is important for looking at matters of stability. And I'm not going to go into this, but these are with aggregate models. And this sort of analysis forms uh, the focus of a lot of uh, rich analytics from colleagues like Jacques uh, Belair in, um, in, in Montreal and, and uh, others who, who study behavior of uh, complex uh, aggregate systems. This for ecological models, for example, uh, with uh, uh, predator and prey. Um, but our goal here is to and, and sometimes I should say, yeah, you could have different basins of attraction. Sometimes you could have one basin where it dies out and another basin, look at it very close by where it takes off. And here, this is something where, you know, if you put in effort, you can head off a, a situation. Often this is associated with lock-in phenomena. Typically it is. So the idea is, you know, there's a lot of phenomena in the world that exhibit um, this situation that can be termed lock-in, where it's easier to prevent something happening than to remediate it once it happens. If you if you deal early with addiction and you head it off, or if you deal early with domestic violence and you head it off or you deal early with issues involving um, a, a communicable disease spreading, um, and you can head it off by having appropriate levels of vaccination or, or appropriate levels of, of uh, hygienic practices or personal protective practices, um, you're going to often be able to save a lot of resources compared to what would be required if you only dealt with it after it had been established, you know, after someone has developed an addiction or after someone has developed a substance use dependency or after someone has developed a habit of using violence interpersonal. And, and this is true at a societal level as well, cycles of poverty, et cetera. And often there's this chance to head it off, which if you can take it, can totally change the situation. We might think about a virtuous cycle associated with obesity and obesity-related chronic disease. And if you can head it off, you, you might be able to get into a situation where costs are much, much lower. But once it's established, it's hard to, it, it, there's very high cost associated with it. And this is associated with two different basins of attraction, one where it dies out, one where it takes off. I'm not going to talk about this much more, but it's a feature of of these systems. What I really want to talk about right now is state space and agent based models. Because for the past bunch of minutes, I've been regaling you with features of state space for aggregate systems, right? But I'm doing that because they're simpler to think about. But now I want to expand our mind to what a state space would look like for an agent based model. Remember one of the ways I started this discussion. I said, when, when I ask you what the state space is for a model, 
I asked, what pieces of information would you need to save away to totally characterize the state of that system? So you could shut down your computer, go away, and you could come back later, plug those values in and continue on. Yeah, so it's those three states, for example, earlier, S, I, and T, I, for that earlier model. For an ABM, what information, let's suppose you have an ABM with 100 people in it, and each of them could be in the state S, I, R, and maybe they can go back from R to S, okay? So sort of a comparable model conceptually to what we saw earlier with, with looping around uh, with the SIT, let's call it R for simplicity. And suppose we want to, we ran that, that agent-based model and you got notice, oh, partway through your running, you have to shut down your computer and come back in and plug the, plug the values back in to, re, to, to continue on. What information would you need to save away? to totally restart that model up again. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing, so, so uh, Nastaran, you said? Okay, a state-based diagram. Well, okay, uh, I, I wanna find out what's the structure of that state-based diagram, so. Okay, agent. Okay. Every agent, you need to remember what state they were in, right? Every single agent, you'd have to remember which, which state they're in. Now, if you think about it, if we had agent, let's imagine for simplicity, each of these agents could be a three state. S, I, we'll call it R, right? Um, even though it, it can go back to S, right? S, I, and R. Suppose we had one agent. How many possible states can that agent be in? This is not a trick question. So they could be in either S, I, or R. So how many states can they be in? How many? Give me a count. Well, okay, but how many possible states could they be in? Three possible states, S, I, or, S, I, or R, right? So most of that, we have two agents. How many states can they be in? Now, of all possibilities, we think about all possible situations, how many possibilities are there? Yeah, three to the power of two, three times three, right? The first agent could be in any of their three states, S, I, or R. And the second agent could be in any of theirs, S, I, and R, right? Okay, suppose now we have three agents. So that was nine, right? Three squared, three times three. Okay, now suppose we have three agents. We'd have three possible for the first, three possible for the second, three possible for the third, right? And in general, if we have N agents, capital N, and each agent can be in one of S possible states, we could have S to the N possibilities, right? This state, this pers person one can be in this state, person two can be in that state. Person and it's any combination of them, right? It's an explosion of numbers of possibilities, right? And that's massive, right? Let's suppose we're dealing with 10 agents only, and each of them can be in two stinking states, S or I, right? We have two for the first agent, two for the second, two for the third, so two times two times two, 10 times, right? Two to the 10th is 1,024, right? Um, if we had 20 agents, it'd be around a million thousand times a thousand. If we had, you know, a hundred agents would be two to the hundredth power, just, you know, some ungodly number of, of combinations, right? It's just massive number of combinations. Um, and it's pretty easy to have an agent-based model where the number of possibilities of possible states that could be in or equal to the number of atoms in the universe or something like that that are estimated to be in the universe. So it's a massively large state space. If we tried to draw it out like this, we would need one dimension. If, if, if agents are in 
either this or this or this, right? Um, we could have each dimension, let's face it, three, S, I, R. Each dimension might be S, I, and R for agent one, S, I, and R for agent two, S, I, and R for agent three, and we'd have N dimensions for the number of agents, right? Massively large state space. But what I'm telling you is for practical agent-based models, what you get is something like this. So nominally, nominally, it's a massive, massive space. But the actual exercised components of that space, the exercised areas of the space, is a very thin manifold of it. Just like this is in 3D space, but it's a very thin manifold. Or better yet, now this. Oh no, okay. Um, okay, so I knocked it again. Sorry. Can you folks hear me again? You can hear me on there? Okay. Yes. So this is like a 1D space within 3D, embedded in 3D, right? This is a this this sort of core, right? This is like one dimensional. You know, it could be on this side or it could be on that side. And um, but it's in 3D, right? It's embedded in 3D, but it's really essentially 1D. And it can be bent a bit like that, but it's still 1D essentially on. It's a 1D manifold. And I'm saying agent-based models have this massive set of possibilities. Gargantuan, you know, set of ginormous set of, of, of possible situations they could be in. But they actually occupy a very thin manifold of it. It is true that when it comes to an infectious disease model, there may be one state where Sam is infected, Mary and Sue are not. And there's another state where Sue is infected and Mary and Sam are not. And another where Sam is infected and, well, and, and Mary's infected and Sue and Sam are not. But if those are all roommates in a home, it's all gonna go in a pretty similar direction, very likely for all three of those possibilities. And, and the truth is that there's so much coupling between agents, so much degree of interplay between agents are so intertwined that, you know, while we might think any agent can be in any possible state, the fact is, you know, there's so much interplay that, that the system tends to go in a certain direction. Infections tend to spread. So, if I'm infected now, maybe right now I'm infected and you folks aren't, but soon you're going to be infected because I'm going to pull off my mask. No, <laughs> you know, but the point is that there's, because of this coupling, there's actually a much lower dimensionality associated with this state, this state space. Now we can see it. Let's go back to our models. Here we go. You can kind of get a sense of it here. I mean, let, let's be clear what's going on here. I, I'm not displaying the full state space of this model. I mean, that would, you know, I'm not gonna be able to show that artistically to say the least, right? Because I need an axis for each of these agents where it is S, I, and R, or S, E, I, R, for each of these agents to be one dimension for one agent, one dimension for another, another one for the next, another one for the next. It, It'd be ungodly horrible. So what I've shown is actually a projected state space, a count. But this should look a lot like what we see when we're looking like at something like this. I mean, it's 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 quite similar, you know, and the details are a little bit different. This didn't have an E compartment and so on. But this is an illustration that. You know, regardless of whether I started this with Sam infected or Mary infected or Sue infected or John infected or what have you, you know, you're going to get a, you know, for, for many of them, not all, maybe, maybe, you know, if we 
started with Elon Musk infected, it wouldn't it wouldn't go like this because he's disconnected from everyone, including sometimes from reality. But that's another matter. Uh, but you know, it wouldn't. It might not go in the same way exactly. But for many, it's going to go in the same way here, right? Um, and uh, the fact is, agent-based models. Um, are very high dimensional, but they only exercise a thin component of possibilities because they are so coupled. And you can see it a little bit here. And guess what? The same thing is true with the world. The world is very complex. The world is more complex than our agent-based model. The world is more textured, it's more entangled, it's more messy, it's more stochastic. Lots of things in the world are very high dimensional. But what we see from the world is indeed emblematic of, of these things we're talking about. So I I called up uh, a little um, uh, our studio session and I, I'm showing you some data here from PHAC for Quebec. And what we have is you know Quebec deaths here shown in this is what's called the delayed embedded form. So here, I'm actually not even looking at deaths versus cases versus hospital beds. We could do that, but if I were to look at these, even just deaths, you could kind of see it almost looks two dimensional. It's a little, a little bit twisted here. It's a bit, it's a bit like this is not totally flat, but it's a bit twisted or or a bit twisted this way. But it almost looks almost looks two dimensional. And, you know, if I were to go in and look at, for example, um, cases versus, you know, uh, kind of deaths versus active and confirmed cases versus uh, active cases, uh, or if I were to look at testing, you could get kind of similar, similar senses. So this also is from, in this case, it's Ontario. Suspected and confirmed cases in one dimension, deaths on another, active cases on another. And guess what? You'd say, oh, wow, it's really, it's really complex. It's in 3D space. Yes, but essentially it looks two-dimensional. This is not from an agent-based model. This is data from the world. And I'll tell you, the world's a lot more complex yet than an agent-based model when it's of the nature of these complex systems, whether they're agent-based models with a lot of coupling or things in the world with a lot of coupling, that you think that it, it might be so explosively high dimensional, we can't possibly think about capturing its dynamics in a simpler way. But in fact, what we see is actually the world is telling us there's actually so much coupling that that there's an orderliness to this that we can take advantage of. Okay. And so it is with agent-based models. With agent-based models, we may have a very descriptively rich agent-based model. And it may be important to capture all these mechanisms, but the actual dynamics elicited may have so much regularity to it that it it teaches us some big lessons um, and points us to to sort of big, clear trade-offs between, say, different interventions. So agent-based models have a very large nominal state space. The theoretical state space of agent-based models is explosively large. Everyone can be in every other state. But in fact, the exercise state space, the the amount of it that's actually in fact, in practice, you know, um, occupied is very, very thin. It's a low dimensional manifold, just like, you know, this, this cord is a very low dimensional manifold in 3D space. It, and that helps us when we're reasoning about what we see from an agent-based model, we're not just expecting total randomness. And we can't just fit it to any data because it's not totally, you know, up to us. It's not totally massive number of degrees of freedom we can fit to anything. No, it's 
it's got so much structure to it that it it has these big patterns that we can take advantage of. Now, uh, when we're we're dealing with systems like this, um, uh, we we also have an advantage. Oh yeah, uh, we should show you the predator prey one. Let's let's go open predator prey. It turns out we're also of an advantage for looking at data from the world with these systems. It's very practical. So I'm going to stop this, and we're going to uh, go open up that other model, which is predator prey agent based modified for state space v6. Okay. V6. Okay. Let's see if we can look, open that up. And what we're going to see here is the space where we're going to have a grid in which prey, shown in green, and predators, shown in red, circulate. And the predators, the red, are hunting the green. They are lynx hunting hares, such as the snowshoe hares that, that visit my lawn regularly. And each, each hare has a singularly simple and almost a, uh, a singularly um, sobering life. It's alive, and then it's either dead because of age or eaten by a lynx. And each lynx basically hunts, and it's either no luck, and it continues on, or it, it eats it, and it's rejuvenated, and it can die uh, if it's not, if it, if it doesn't eat frequently enough, it can die. Otherwise, it can eat, and over time from age, it will die at their life expectancy, length's life expectancy. So this is the idea. And, and there's some spatial movements around. Very high dimensional system. But what this model does, and, and I, I'm actually not completely certain how long this can be run with any logic PLE, but uh, I'll run it here. What we will see is you know, the space and, and there's fewer links at first and lots of prey, lots of uh, lots of hairs and the number of links are going up. They're multiplying because they have babies. Um, little links, probably called kits or something. And you'll notice the number of links are going up and the number of hairs are going down. But you'll also notice that we're plotting it in a state space plot. So hairs on the x-axis and links on the y-axis. And here you can see at a glance this relationship between them. And you can see for certain periods of time, it almost looks linear. And then it's, you know, you're, you're again getting this approach to a quasi equilibrium where it's alternating um, and, and uh, circulating in this kind of cycle of sorts. Uh, it's not quite a perfect cycle, but um uh you you could see it there now interestingly ladies and gentlemen it turns out that the state space plot here is mirrored in kind of stretched squeezed version and the stretching and squeezing are in essential you can kind of undo them etc over here on the right but these plots to the right are not in fact generated from links and hairs. They're generated from just one of those each. Hairs at the top. So if you look at hairs now versus hairs a day ago, for example, or you or whatever the time unit is, or links now versus links a day ago, you see something that's basically the same picture as here. It's just stretched and squeezed in a certain way. So here's the thing about this fact about the world that the fact that the world is occupies this sort of small, small subspace of things. So we have this, you know, this 
it's it's really only occupying this very small subspace of this 3D space, like for this. The fact that the world is like that means that any one piece of information about the world, like data just on length, or sorry, just on hair, or data separately, just on length, just one of them will tell you about the other. If you know that the number of pairs are really, really large right now, it will tell you that if there's many, many hairs, it's going to tell you that probably the length of uh, population is, is not that large because there wouldn't be so many hairs without it. And it's probably growing because lengths thrive on hairs. If you see the number of hairs going down, down, down really quickly, it's probably because there's a lot of lengths. So the information in one tells you about the information on the other. And so it is. You can see here that information about hairs, just hairs, reflects that from both lengths and hairs. Information about just lengths reflects that from both lengths and hairs. And lengths and hairs, it's, it's not super neat by any means, but it's a, it, it looks kind of like a lower dimensional space like there. It's, they're circulating in kind of these rough cycles. Um, and you see them reflected here. So this fact about the world, that there is this, uh, that there is uh, this coupling going on where the nominal state space is much thinner. Sorry, the the, the occupied state space, the the uh, intrinsic state space, as we call it, is much thinner than the nominal state space. The theoretical state space is huge in a nature-based model and in the world, but the occupied components of it are very thin. It's a thin manifold. One of the things that goes along with coupled systems like this is that information about any one piece tells us uh, about other pieces of that system, okay? So we have this distinction between nominal dimensionality and intrinsic dimensionality that's very large. And, and it turns out that these coupled systems, um, you will typically have one, one part of the system, let's say hairs, its evolution depends heavily on length. And lengths is evolution depends heavily on hairs. Lengths die out unless they can eat hair. Hairs drop in population because lengths are eating them and rise in population if there are few lengths. They're very coupled. In an SIRS model, I depends on S. Or in an age based model, the health of a child in a household is coupled with other children in the household and the parents in the household for a communicable disease. And there's a lot of interplay here between these different components. Now, the fact that these things are so entangled means that the information about one encodes information about the other. I said earlier, information about hairs. If there's tons and tons of hairs, it tells you something about the lynx population. There must not be many of them, and they're probably grown. If you tell me, just something about lynxes that there's, you know, the lynx population is dropping quickly. It's probably because there's not many hairs around. Probably tells you something about that. So one tells you about the other. And and it it so happens this is a mathematical fact. And if if we use the classic predator prey model, turns out if you just go and try to solve this. You can actually solve, for example, for y here, just by solving these equations, which is the classic predator prey ODEs, uh, ordinary differential equations. You can solve for y, the number of lengths, as a function of x and just constant. So x and x dot. So y here, the, these are just constants, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, delta gamma. And I could take these equations and I could solve for them. I could give y as a function of x and x dot. What this is saying is 
if I don't know why, I can just use these to tell what y is, right? Like if I have x and I have x dot, I can get what y is based on these constants. But similarly, if I don't know x, if I just have the rate of change of y and, and the actual value of y, I could tell you what x is. So again, if, if I said there's tons of lengths, but their numbers are dropping, what that's saying is there are few pairs. If I say, you know, there's tons and tons of hairs and their numbers are, are still rising, it's a sign there's very, very few links. So, so this is true in general for these systems and it's true for agent-based systems. And it turns out with agent-based systems, um, uh, as with uh, simpler systems, as with aggregate systems, this allows us to reconstruct the state space of the system using just one piece of data. Okay, so, sorry, using one type of data, not one piece, one type of data. So observations of links, I can know about the broader dynamics of the system that's driving it, links and hairs. Data about if, if you give me infectives over time, I can tell you about the structure of the system, S-E-I-R, that's driving infectives. If you give me hospitalizations over time, number of hospital admissions, I can tell about the system that's driving that, and that includes susceptibles, it includes infectives, it includes people recovering, et cetera, because the information is embedded in it. And the basic idea is to use what's called the delay embedding. You look at the value now, and you look at the value a certain amount of time ago, say a day ago, or two days ago, and three days ago, and you create these vectors. I don't have time to go into this. You'll find videos of me talking about this in detail. But what we see it is right here, right? If we compare hairs now versus hairs t minus one, we find there's a correspondence here. If we look at links now versus links um, one day, we find that there's a correspondence. Do you see that? There's a there's this is kind of a stretched version of that, and as they as they uh, evolve, you will find it um, uh, evolving. So, in in sort of corresponding ways. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we have these complex systems in the world, they are nominally very high dimensional. By the way, this is shows the same correspondence. Here is this one shown with lynxes and hairs. And here's only with links. Oh, I went too far. Only links and only hairs. Uh, it showed basically the same structure. So when we have observations from the world, from complex systems in the world, we, um, oh, did I get disconnected? Huh? Uh, I'm, I'm confused. No, I guess not. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so... The world is, is a messy, complex place. Our age-based models are also very complex. But both from the world and from the models, we have a massive number of possibilities, but realistically, only a small subset of those are in fact exercised. Only a small subset are in fact uh, explored within the state space. There is such structure that the dynamics that are actually observed from the world and from our HMS models are often lower dimensional dynamics. We think there's explosively many possibilities, many degrees of freedom, but things are so coupled that the actual number of exercise degrees of freedom is just incomparably low. You tell me about just you know a small subset of the population about their infection rates, and I can tell you a lot about the rest of the population. Things are coupled in the world. Things are coupled in our models. And it's extremely useful in our models 
to look at the state space portraits, just as it's very useful in the world to look at these state space portraits of, of sorts. So early on, I showed you these, these state space portraits from the world. When you're building an agent model, an agent based model, it's very useful to build up plots that are not only plots over time, but plots of variables here like these. The world, of course, has different people in it, but a very useful lens is to aggregate them up and say daily reported cases. Not looking at this axis, whether Mary's infected, this axis, whether Sam is infected. No, we're looking the number of cases here and the number of deaths here. We aggregate up because it speaks to us about the underlying low dimensional dynamics that emerge from these complex situations. And it's very useful. So when you're building an agent-based model, build plots like this so that you can get a high level picture on what's going on. It's often very, very useful. I showed you that plot earlier involving susceptibles, infected, recovered, where we were seeing that trade off as susceptibles dropped, infectives rose, et cetera. These are very useful things for reasoning. That's one takeaway. Another takeaway is there's a lot of low dimensional dynamics. Uh, that can be spotted from those plots if you keep your eye out for it. And, and the model puts out results with structure that are not just malleable and fit to anything. There actually is a lot of orderliness there, which can only match certain types of phenomena from the world. Uh, so it's, it's a valid sort of uh, structured uh, the, the theory has testable implications. A third, uh, a third important thing here is that when we are dealing with data from the world, um, while we can take advantage of multiple types of data, say cases here and deaths here, when we have it, that's very useful. Even one type of data, um, for example, here, so, and by the way, these are two different things, admissions versus bed. But even one type of, um, of, of information, like cases now, cases a week ago, cases two weeks ago, or cases now, cases yesterday, cases the day before, can give us these pictures of the dynamics of the system, which are very useful, and help us to recognize underlying structures in this data that correspond to important features of this system in the world. These sorts of portraits are used for a reason because when applied with data from the world, they are helpful for reasoning about the behavior of worlds in a model-free way as well. You could see these patterns, maybe right now you're in this red point, you've gone up like this and you're coming down like this and you know with high likelihood where that point is going next. I've heard colleagues of mine call these, analogize these to hurricane plots. You can kind of see where they're heading. And in an agent-based model, it's often very useful to have these because you can get a sense of its, its underlying dynamics even if you only produce it with a single time series, it can be extremely useful for understanding the dynamics of the whole system. So when we have data from a complex system, from our model, from the world, it is often useful to create these plots that are state space plots with different variables on different axes or with the same variable but lag this variable, the current value, this one, the value of some fixed time ago, the third axis, if you want, uh, twice that amount of time ago, and to plot these out. And you can often reason about them, about where the system is going and spot elements of structure that would otherwise not be visible with just a time series plot or a collection of time series plot. So 
state spaces of dynamic models um, have great value um, to be used in, in lenses and using them with uh, taking advantage of the ability to aggregate up components of them can often give real insight into the behavior of the system that is otherwise hard to, uh, hard to obtain purely from time plots. So you might think in your final reports of, of plotting out some state space plots um, and feel free to do it based on aggregate quantities like this. Feel free to do it based on a single time series, just lagged of different amounts or do it on multiple time series against each other. Um, both of those can be very fruitful. And uh, I hope you'll give that some consideration when you're interpreting data from the world or data from these sorts of models. Okay, um, so that's all we have time for today. Thank you for your attention and I will open up office hours.